Hello everyone, um, welcome to another Grays of Westminster live stream from all four corners of the globe it seems you're all uh, tuning in so thank you for joining me it is a gorgeously sunny day here in the virtual Grays of Westminster secondhand apartment. <laughs> I looked very confused on the feed so it looks like you've got the few seconds of me staring confusedly at my screen I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so today I'm talking about the SBR1C1, which is the close-up commander kit and its various iterations and what comes in the box and what you can do with it and other tips and tricks to do with close-up flash and why you might want to use a close-up flash. So for those of you who aren't subscribers, which I'm sure is not many, um, if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe. Just press that little subscribe button, press the bell icon and away you go. Oh, I hope there's sound because I've got my microphone plugged in. Testing. <laughs> I hope you haven't got me muted because I'm not muted. Um, someone's going to, yeah, it's very muggy. I'm hoping that someone can hear me. Can everyone else hear me? Just David Downward and David Jervis can't hear me. Maybe you've got me muted. Okay. I don't know. YouTube wasn't me. It was just whatever. Ah, Simon's joined as well. Okay, so I have some pictures from Simon. Simon has been very, very helpful because I didn't have that many pictures. It had been a number of years since I used the SBR1C1 and I wanted to kind of give you a complete idea of what you could use it for. I actually could not find some of the pictures um, that I wanted to show you, but, but Simon has sent me um, a wonderful selection. So I'm going to go through some of his. I'm going to go through some of mine. Um, I'm glad everyone can hear me. I'm sorry that some of you can't hear me, but it might just be that you've got me muted. Just look on your screen. You might have the little X down there that says I've been muted. Good. Glad everything's working fine. All right. So apart from subscribing, you can also contribute to the coffee fund. I talk about it every day. That's how I keep going. <laughs> I am so hyper. No, I'm not really, but I do. I do appreciate the Coffee Fund contribution. So if you feel like contributing, please do. It is the Snapchat icon. Um, not Snapchat, Super Chat. <laughs> I don't even know what Snapchat is. Um, it's something that children use apparently or young people. <laughs> anyway, so um, Super Chat icon or PayPal me link, which is below if you're not watching this live. All right, enough of that. So what do we use the SBR1C1 for? Um, well, the most frequent and common use is for close-ups of flowers or macro photography, just generally anything close-up. What you probably find when you get very, very close to your subject, when you've got your lens and you've got your subject very, very close, is that you don't have enough light getting into the lens in order to really correctly expose. And then you've got to faff about with things like bumping the ISO up or maybe using a shutter speed that you're not so happy with. The other problem as I've talked about many times, um, is the closer you get to the subject, the shallower the depth of field becomes. So you end up having to use smaller apertures. And of course, smaller apertures also let in less light. So we need to find a solution for this. Now, the SBR1C1, and I'm just gonna give you a little preview of what it currently looks like on my camera. Hopefully you can see that. It is a monster. Um, this is with the SU800 unit. So let me just, um, I'm gonna talk about why you've got one or don't have one in your kit, depending on what you buy and what camera you have. But apart from flowers and macro and insects and things like that, you can also use it for things like food photography, uh, for still life, and I even, the pictures I couldn't find and I wished I could, um, you can use it for portraiture. Um, a few years back, I did a Nikon school course on the subject of flash and the SBR1C1s, we used them with models and we actually um, had loads of fun just getting that catch light in the eyes um, by using the SBR1C1. It is quite a formidable looking thing. Um, I don't think it's necessarily less formidable than the, um, there's the Elencrom ring flashes, which John uses, or some of the other ring flashes that are available. It's not it's not less formidable, it's just there's there's a lot of gear. Now, to explain this, so these two little things here are remote flash units. They are completely wireless. They only work with the Nikon creative lighting system. Um, I will also explain what that is for those of you that don't know. So with the SBR1C1 or the R1, you get those two little SBR200s, these things. The, the choice that you have is whether or not you have this 
extra thing. Now the SU800 is super useful if you have a camera that doesn't have a built-in flash. So the Z cameras, for example, or the D850 or the D5 or the D500, um, if you've got any of those cameras or D780, if you don't have a built-in flash, you would need an S, um, SU800 to actually make your SBR 200s fire. Um, I'm gonna get tongue twisted, just putting it out there. <laughs> <laughs> but the SU-800 is an infrared commander. So what this does is it sits on the hot shoe of the camera and it tells remote flashes to fire. It also works with all of the other Nikon creative lighting system flashes. So not just these little SBR 200s, but also it will work with the SB-5000, the SB-900, 910, 800, 700, 500, and even my old SB600 works with that as well. So if you want off camera flash and you don't have an SB5000 and a WR10 kit, which I talked about the other day, if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the other stream. So if you don't have an SB5000 and the WR10 and your camera does not have a built-in flash, you need one of those. Um, also, if you've got one of the smaller bodies like the 3000 or 5000 series, they also don't control remote flashes from their pop-up flash. So you, again, you would need one of these. So the difference in a nutshell between the SBR one and the SBR one C one is the C stands for commander. So it has the commander in the box. If it doesn't have the commander in the box, it will be just called the SBR one. Right, gotten that out of the way. So the SU800, David mentioned he wanted me to talk about this and I will talk about this. This is a very, very useful little thing because it can fire multiple flashes for different groups, um, for different channels. So you can have different flashes at different strengths and um, you can use different flash compensation when you put your flashes into gr different groups. Talk all about that as well. Um, but essentially for today's purpose, we want it to fire the SBR 200s, which are the little remote flashes. Now, the other things that you get in the box, you get a lot in the box, and I didn't bring the entire box with me because it's massive. Um, and unfortunately, I mistakenly thought that Nikon would have it on their website and they don't have a picture of it. Um, it's a big leather black case that looks like that. It has lots of little compartments in it. And the curious thing is that when you buy it brand new, there's lots of holes in your box. You open up the, the case and you realize that there's far more space than there should be. Um, that's because Nikon know that most people won't just want to use two SBR 200. So I'm just going to remove the, the ring from the front of my lens now. So this ring takes your two SBR 200s that you get when you buy the kit, but you can actually mount up to six. I've never mounted six at one time. I've done three or four, um, and it is useful to have an extra one or two, which is why there's extra holes in the box for the SBR one, so that you can add your own SBR 200. So what a lot of people do is they buy the SBR one or the R1C one, and then they add to it extra SBR 200 so that they've got loads. Um, the handy thing about these is that you don't have to have them on this thing to work. You don't have to have them actually sitting on the front of your, your camera. You can use them off camera. They come with little stands, which I forgot to bring with me. So I had to improvise a bit on my stands, but um, you can have them off camera. I'm gonna show you some pictures um, of how that works. And you can also simultaneously fire the other flashes at the same time as these if you do want to get super fancy. I have, I think, one example of me doing that, um, which I'll show you in a bit. David asks, can you use the SB500 or SB910, etc., as a commander? Yes. So any flash that has the commander mode built into it, so 500, 700, uh, 800, 900, 910, 5,000. Those flashes, any flash that has both commander as well as slave um, in it will also fire these. So if you've got a flash and you're quite happy for it to sit on your hot shoe and fire your SBR 200, that's a lot of light is the only thing. But if you're happy for that, then you can use those flashes, no problem. Thank you very much, Gary. Everyone give Gary a round of applause for the uh, opening contribution to the Coffee Fund. Much appreciated. Um, is the ring a certain diameter? Ah, so what else do you get in the box? You get... These, I've got a few, but they're actually attached to lenses. I'm gonna show you them now. This is a 77 mil one. Um, so in the box, you get 52, 62, 67, 72, and 77 mil diameter rings. And all of those rings, they go on the front of your various lenses. So obviously if you've got 
an obscure size lens, if you've got an 82 or a 95 mil lens, or if you've got one of the sort of in between, like the 18 to 55 has a um, 55 mil diameter. I don't remember because I didn't bring it, but I don't think it also has a 58 mil diameter. Um, Simon might be able to tell me that actually, because I didn't look, because <laughs> I don't, I don't have any lenses now that have a 58 mil diameter. But it comes with these. Um, these have the rather catchy name of SY1, and then the diameter. So this is called an SY167. Um, this is called an SY177 because it's a 77 mil diameter. So you screw this onto the front of your lens. And the thing that I like about this is you can. You can basically leave them on your lenses. So for example, here's my 35 mil that I've got the 67 on. And then on my camera, I've got the 60 mil macro that's got the 62 mil one on. And then my little ring just clips like that. It has a little clip and it just clips onto the front. So you can leave the rings on if you're not using filters or if you're frequently changing lenses. Um, you can just leave the rings on and then just take the uh, actual adapter on and off your camera so you're not completely stuck um now ian thank you thank you so much for your contribution to the coffee fund that is very very appreciated um i'm just checking i didn't um <laughs> miss any questions um simon is also pitching in there and answering the the questions in between which is great so if you miss something that i say or if i miss one of your questions then he's picking up which is great um all right 24 to 72.8 can't has it has a bulging bulging front no it doesn't 24 72.8 doesn't have a bulging front um it has a 77 mil diameter the 14 24 2.8 has no diameter However, Andy, if you're referring to the 24 to 70 VR 2.8, which I talked about the other day, that has an 82 mil diameter. So you don't have an adapter that will fit that one, sadly. But if you've got one of the other more common ones, I mean, all the macro lenses are 52 or 62 mil. So there's no problem there. Those are supplied. Um, I, for example, did some flash work with the 3514. That's a 67 mil diameter. So I put that on. I didn't try it with um, anything 77, but back in the day when I did this with the Nikon school, I was using a 24 to 70 and the 77 mil adapter and it worked just fine. So that, that 2470 certainly works. Anyway, there we go. So apart from the rings and the big ring and these little SBR 200s, you also get things like diffusers that clip on the front you've got this little um jet you have to have this on if you want anything to fit on this is just a filter clip but essentially you can put your gels in there you get gels as well as well as the stands um and you also get which i didn't bring because i didn't need it a thing very snazzy name again it's called an sg3 ir oh my goodness essentially it's a thing <laughs> that clips on to your hot shoe and flaps over the front of your built-in flash. So if you've got the SBR one and you don't want the flash to just blow out your um, your picture completely, then you get this little thing. It's very, very cute. It's like a little arm and it flaps over the front of your built-in flash and it stops the, um, the flash from showing on the picture, but still allows the signal to reach the remote flashes. Very, very clever. So they, they almost thought of everything, or they tried, certainly. You also get things like um, a little diffuser panel and an arm clip so you can add some diffusion. Again, I didn't bring that, I didn't feel the need for it, but actually probably could have used it for this um, experimentation. Um, could you use a stop down ring from the 82 to the 77? You could, you certainly could. You'd probably get quite a lot of vignetting because if you think about it, this contraption is then a little bit outside of the front of the lens. So if you had an 82 mil, you could get a step down ring and then you could put the 77 ring and then you could put this thing on the front. It's possible, if depends on the focal length of the lens as to whether or not that would work, but I don't see why not. Um, yes, you're right, Andy, or the fish eyes, they also have bulging front elements. So those kind of things you're not gonna necessarily use it for, but if you're using it for macro, which is the main kind of topic or portraiture or still life, then you'll generally be using lenses which are kind of in the middle of Nikon's range and have the more common filter sizes for the front. So let me show you some pictures of what is uh, what it looks like, just so you don't have to look at me waving my camera in front of you. Um, here we go. 
Right, so these are Simon's pictures. He's actually set it up on his Z7, uh, I'm guessing, um, with all the bits and pieces and also a, a base plate and a tabletop tripod. So as you can see in action here, you've got the SU800, he's got the 105 macro with the FTZ, and then the two SBR200s with their diffusers attached on the front here. Um, this is what the back of the SU800 screen looks like. If you are using things like flash compensation, for example, um, you will see things like this where you've got um, a plus two uh, flash compensation for group A. So maybe this flash is group A and then this flash is group B. I'm going to show you that on the flashes as well so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and then this is what it looks like from the front. So when you are getting very close to a subject, sometimes the flash from here doesn't quite reach the subject. Whereas if you've got these diffusers, it actually angles the light onto the subject, which is very handy. This is what they look like without the diffusers. Um, and then this is just kind of, this is the little stand. So this is where you've got one flash on the camera and then one off camera, perhaps providing a bit of fill. And then just the other extra bits, this is the clip I was talking about. So you get this little clip here and you get this white um, diffuser board, if you like, which can be quite helpful if you're doing certain pictures of flowers and things like that. So let's have a look at some of Simon's pictures um, using this setup. I'll also show you some of mine, but Simon's are always fantastic. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you his first. Um, so here we go. I've actually very cleverly printed out the information supplied. So this is a carnation. That is um, a given. And you can see when you get very, very close, as I said, you usually end up with quite a shallow depth of field. So you have to be quite clever about your aperture settings. Um, so the SBR200s actually just provide that extra illumination so you can use slightly small apertures. Um, these are some chive flowers. Uh, this is a white rose. I'm now going to show you the mock-up um, diagram of for these images. So the subject was here, got the background, which was a white perspex sheet with 40% light transmission. There was a, so you've got one SBR200 on the camera, one off the camera, and then Simon has a supplementary third one acting as a backlight, uh, which is very, very interesting because then you get this lovely white background, which you otherwise wouldn't get. You'd get shadows if you just had all of the light coming on the front. Um, so this was with the Z6 with the 105 macro and the SU800 on top. As I said, you need the SU800 if you don't have a built-in flash on your camera. And then you've got group A, group B. So do you know how I was talking about, and then this is group C. So just to show you, let me uh, flip over quickly so you can see the top here. Let's, let's get it without reflections. That would be good. Okay, so you've got your on off button and your sort of modeling flash there and then on this side you've got group a b and c and you've got your channels one two three and four i have talked a little bit about how the creative lighting system works in previous streams but essentially you need to have your camera or your su800 if you're using one on the same channel as the flash the reason that we have channels is so that when you are in a place where perhaps lots of people are firing off flashes you're let's say you're on group one. If everyone else was on group one, then you'd all be firing each other, other's flashes at the same time. So you have different channels to make sure that you're only talking to the flashes that you want to talk to. Um, so those are your channels. Then separately, you've got your groups. Now group A, B and C is just a way for you to separate your flashes into different categories. So let's say for one portion of the frame, you want a slightly overexposed, you want more light coming from that section. Whereas in the other side, let's say from another flash, you want it to be a half a stop or a stop underexposed so that you get a slightly more contrasty light. By putting your flashes into groups, you then have the ability to control what each group does. So that's why it's very useful. And that's why Simon's got those um, specifications written down on his diagram. So I'm going to uh, switch back and show you that. So as I said, group A, this was set just to TTL. This is group B, this was set to TTL, but had a, a two thirds of a stop 
below the main light so it had some flash compensation there and then this one was set to half the maximum output by setting it to manual so you can do that you've got a group a b and c and you can have all three flashes doing different things and then as a result you get pictures like this so this is a close-up of this shot just to show you the quantity of detail that you can get by having enough illumination um, now this is actually a clematis is it it must be the cl uh, clematis leaves Gosh, never known that they look like that close up, but they probably do. Um, so this is with the Z7, 105 macro at f11, hence the great depth of field there. Uh, two hundredth of a second, ISO 200. So then you've got the two SBR 200s mounted on the lens for this. So this is straight on the camera. Simon is much more organized than I am. So when I show you my pictures, I'm going to be vaguely remembering what I did. <laughs> It's probably just as well we do his first. All right, so this is also a clematis flower. Um, this one I know for sure because I recognize it. Um, so I've got the same settings written down for that one. Now this is French lavender. Um, this was also shot at f11. It's amazing what you can do with those smaller apertures um, when you've got some extra supplementary light. So with this, both two of the SBR 200s were actually mounted on the lens. Um, and then there was a mixture of the sunlight from behind and the light coming in. One of the, the really useful things I find you can use the SBR 200s for is filling, fl filling flash or fill flash, I should say, when you've got a very heavily backlit subject. I've got an example I'll show you of that as well um, from a different set of shots. But it's just if you normally have backlit situations, you'll know this would ordinarily just be completely underexposed all the detail would disappear but if you've got some fill flash coming from the front it actually helps to illuminate the front of the subject so it can be very useful um all right now this is a an orange slice i don't know i think it opened it out of sequence which is possibly why i got confused about the numbers of pictures but anyway so this is uh yeah an orange slice and this is also the 105 2.8 also at f11 um head on that one and this one also at f11 so f11 is a preferable aperture for simon to use for these for these shots i think i bobbed between f11 and f16 i i dared to go to f16 at one point but don't tell anyone um and then here's also some still life so these are coins some cash money also at f11 with two sbr 200s most of the shots that i did were also with two sbr 200s so i'll show you those I, I did many years ago use three um, and that was quite fun but it produces quite a lot of light what I did do with my set of let's say experiments were um, was to add my SB600 as an extra light when I was trying to do some very dramatic shadows on some still life that I was doing but food photography flowers very very close up macro insects um, cash <laughs> all of that stuff you can use the SBR 200s for all right, so let me just have a look at the comments. People have been very busy commenting while I've been talking. Uh, flash won't work in silent mode. Yes, I have the caveats written down. I will I will talk about those. It's same as with the D850. So just to explain something, because uh, Mr. Hookshanks has talked about it. If you've got a camera that has silent live view mode, um, like the Zs or the D850, the flash won't fire. So if you've ever had that trouble where you're trying to shoot something and the flashes don't fire, check that you're not on silent mode because that makes all the difference. Take the camera off silent mode in live view and it will work just fine. Same with the Z6s, the Z7s and everything. Um, another important point, if you're using flash with the Z cameras, there is a setting that I will tell you about because quite a few people ask me this. I believe it is setting Custom settings menu D8, but I'm going to just double check. Yes, it is. Um, so what happens with a, a, a kind of what you see is what you get electronic viewfinder. Obviously, when you are taking pictures with flash and the flash is providing extra light, you tend to have very small apertures um, and sometimes very fast shutter speeds. So this means that what you look at through the viewfinder is going to be completely black because the flash is supplementing all the light. The, the way that I usually test whether or not the flash is going to control the light or whether it's providing fill flash is to take a shot with the flash off and if the frame is completely black then I know all the light is coming from the flash. That's how you can tell. So 
with a Z, that's very annoying because then you suddenly can't see what you're focusing on or what you're doing. So if you go to custom settings menu, um, shooting display option D8, I've no idea if you can see this, let me have a look, there we go. Um, right down the bottom it says apply settings to live view. So what that does is it then stops the camera from giving you the what you see is what you get if you turn it off. And that means that you can use flash comfortably without wondering whether or not you're focusing on the right thing or trying to see what you're doing. So those are two just tips if you've got newer cameras. So silent photography, flash doesn't work. And if you've got apply settings to live view on, then you won't be able to see what you're doing necessarily. It will be a little bit like steering blind. So you can turn that off with D8 option. Thank you so much, Mr. Hookshanks. Uh, thank you, David uh, Cotton. And thank you, David Jervis. Thank you so much for your contributions to the Coffee Fund. Round of applause, everyone, please. Um, all right, so let me just see if I missed anyone. Small studio in a box. Yes, it is a bit like a studio in a box, actually. It's really, really useful. Um, yeah, there we go. Simon said what I said. <laughs> so the, uh, the sheet now. So the sheet that you get in the box, and I wish I'd brought it, but I didn't think I was going to need it, so I didn't. Um, the sheet that you get in the box is not a full, full white sheet of paper. It's actually a semi kind of almost transparent. It's not quite transparent um, sheet. I think it's written down how opaque it is in the box. Um, but that is what you get in the box. And it's quite small. It's not, it's not sizable at all. So it's only good if you're shooting kind of smallish subjects, really. Some of the still life that I did was quite big, would have been useless for that. So it, it's not always useful. The little arm clip can be quite useful because you can hook it on to different things and then you can position your diffusers in different, different ways and places. Uh, before I forget, John mentions that they take CR123s. It's a little fat battery like that. You can buy them from supermarkets. You can buy them from Amazon. Um, honestly, they're very easy to get hold of. Some people find them a bit confusing because they're not normal double A's, but that's what they take. The SBR200s each take a battery and then the SU800 takes one as well. So you need three in total if you've got the full kit. Um, okay, so our nun, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to read Gordon's message, but I don't think I understood it. So you, so basically all of the Nikon flashes can be fired on the same channel. You could have mega flashes going on. You could have like five or 10 flashes firing all at the same time if you wanted to, as long as you put them on the same channel. Um, so yeah, so Simon was talking about diffraction. I cheated. <laughs> um, I cheated a bit and I use a much smaller aperture. It does not work with electronic shutters. There's all kinds of little caveats, but yeah, you've got, there is, Simon's explaining. I'm gonna let Simon explain <laughs> how that works. So now that we know what we can use it for in, in that sense and not using live view on silent mode and making sure that you've got your um, D8 in your Zs turned off if you are gonna go down this route. Um, let's also talk about moody flower portraits. So last week I wanted to talk to you a little bit about making portraits of flowers. And then I read this great article um, about using very, very small F numbers to, to kind of achieve that blacked out background. But I found most of the time I wasn't getting enough light or the light wasn't hitting quite right. So the principle of that is you've got a flower and you've got a very messy background around it and you want to kind of isolate the flower. So in order to do that, you tend to use quite a small aperture to start off with, about f11, and then you have to adjust your shutter speed and keep getting smaller and smaller until basically the background disappears. The problem with that is obviously, unless you've got a shaft of light pointing directly onto the, the flower, you're not necessarily gonna get a perfectly exposed picture. So to get around that, if you use the close-up flashes, which is what I did um, in some examples that I will show you shortly. Um, you can get those lovely moody flower portraits where everything is black. So Simon went the route of having a nice white background so that everything looks very clean and fresh. And I went down the route of having a very dark, <laughs> moody background because that was what I was feeling. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of those pictures if I just make sure that I've got the right thingy open. I hope I do. Uh, should be underneath all of this. There we go. So just to show you an example, this was a tulip, no flash, at f 3.5 thereabouts. Um, and it was not an exciting picture. I didn't love it. Um, so 
I switched over to having the SBR 200s on the front and I used F11, which I was much happier with just because, first of all, a lot more of the tulip was in focus, but also it just created this very kind of moody looking um, background, which I enjoyed. And then I did the same, I used F16. <laughs> Because I know you get diffraction, but I, I thought I could get away with it. And I could, I reckon. I'm not going to print this into a billboard size, so it was fine for the purpose that um, that I wanted to use it for. Um, here is a bunch of tulips with that same... I, now, the interesting thing about the SBR 200s is you can really angle these flashes quite considerably. So I probably took about 10 of these pictures, having them in different positions. This position that I liked the most was actually top and bottom. So I had the SBR 200 one up there and I had one down there mounted on the front of the camera. And you would not necessarily know from this picture how messy my kitchen table is. You can't see it. <laughs> I've got piles of kids homework on there. Um, so the SBR 200 was perfect for shooting at that small aperture, very fast shutter speed, just so that I could illuminate the tulips in the way that I wanted to. Because to be honest, the natural light effect was not doing it for me at all. Whereas this was a much more pleasing kind of effect. I preferred the, the drama of this one. Now, just to show you something completely psychedelic, um, put a red and a blue gel on, <laughs> that's what you get, psychedelic tulips. Um, now, the, the gels are very interesting, actually, because they tell you on them what you need to do. So for this, you need to use auto white balance. If you're going to use a tungsten or a fluorescent gel, then you need to use flash compensation. So and it actually explains it on the um, well, not flash compensation, exposure compensation, and it explains it on the gel. So when you do use the gels, you just need to bear that in mind. But I thought, wow, that's kind of funky. Looks um, very 80s. <laughs> so. That's some examples of using these smaller apertures as a F16. I felt I could get away with it. I think I did just about manage to get away with it there. Um, oh, I've minimized you now. Let me bring you back. Here we go. So, so those are some examples. I've got some others, but that's indoor um, flower portraiture. Now, talking about sort of isolating your subject from the background and using it for outdoors, um, as you you may have been lucky enough to experience some very bright sunny weather you tend to get very very harsh shadows at the moment so when you're doing flower photography you've either got this kind of stark sunlight or you've got very very deep dark shadows and taking pictures of insects or anything in those dark shadows is quite difficult now also not on the Z cameras because there's certain shutter speeds and things that you can't use but if you're just using normal shutter speeds normal um normal shutter mode and you want to shoot at a very very fast shutter speed joe mcnally in our in our stream a couple of weeks ago talked about um putting your cameras onto high fp auto sync which means that basically the flash will do as much as it can and you can use as fast a shutter speed as you like obviously the flashes aren't designed to be able to deal with shutter speeds that fast but you can use them and it will just blast out the power as quickly as it can for you. So you can just leave that mode on. Um, so when you're shooting insects, they move very quickly and there's autofocus as part of the, the challenge. And also if you're manually focusing, then that's also part of the challenge and catching one in the act of landing on a flower or something can be quite tricky. Um, but with an SBR 200, Depending on what lens you have, this works better or worse than um, than other methods. But it just means that you can use those faster shutter speeds without having your picture completely underexposed. Um, I actually don't know if I saved the like the not so good pictures, but I certainly saved some of the nicer ones. So um, this was some shots of a bee. Now the bee was very busy, <laughs> and um, I caught him just landing on this. I actually got quite a lot of shots of him in the depths of this um, jasmine, but this was probably my favorite one. Also because the sun, as you can see from the, the basically the blown out highlights just around the detail here, the sun was beating down, which meant that down here, he was in quite a lot of shadow, but the SBR 200s, both of them positioned at the top of the lens, managed to catch him and you get that little um, catch light in the back of him there but also just it's it's very sharp I think this may even also be slightly cropped because um, I cropped it afterwards but you can see how sharp he is there and that was from using an incredibly fast shutter speed I was probably using about I'm guessing about a thousandth of a second um, 
here is another example. This is a little ladybird. Also was quite tricky. He kept flying away and I managed to catch him just as he was, um, just before he flew away from this uh, rose bush, which also has other things. I know this is not a rose, but this was. So, um, so being able to catch him by using a very fast shutter speed, I could only do that by using the flashes. Um, I, these are slightly out of sequence, but here is an example of me trying to isolate the subject from the background and it just coming out completely underexposed and then doing the same with the SBR 200. So I wanted a black background, I didn't want a white background and instead of, um, of having this messy background and having a slower exposure, I had a nice fast exposure, but then I had the SBR 200 to help illuminate the flower. Um, I don't have a natural light version of that, otherwise I'd show you how busy the background was and the picture would just have not communicated in the same way that it does by having the background gone. Uh, this last one, obviously snails don't move super fast, but just to show you a difference, exactly the same positions, um, this little snail just sleeping in here, and then with the flash, it's interesting how different the atmosphere of those two pictures are. I'm not saying it's the best picture in the world, but certainly it's just interesting. These were with the 35 1.4, I think, because I was... Um, shooting with that you can you can use it with lenses that aren't macro lenses that's one of the beauties of it so you don't actually have to use a macro lens um, to use the SBR 200 you can use it with loads of different things all right I will show you the still lives in just a minute but I want to just double check the comments because I'm sure that people have been very busy here we go uh, uh, when the image has scientific purposes flash can be of invaluable use yes exactly and trying to get as much detail as possible uh randall yes busy bee exactly i told myself a joke there uh so yeah when it comes to light from flash units the inverse square law can be very beneficial this is very true when the image uh no i've read that one already good okay good so i'm up to date on the comments all right so uh moody flower portraits is one use um needing to use small aperture numbers is another use needing to use very fast shutter speeds another situation in which that can be useful is if you've got a very windy day. It was quite windy yesterday when I was taking pictures so I had to contend with bees flying around and also leaves moving back and forward and things like that. So actually using the speed lights allowed me to use a faster shutter speed than I normally would and then I ended up getting shots that I was very very pleased with. Um, so that's another use for it. Now um, and one thing that a lot of people encounter when they're shooting with bellows, just as an example, if you're shooting with a bellows unit, you end up with your lens so close to the subject that it ends up being slightly dimmed. The, there's not enough light between the subject and the front of the lens. I've never reverse mounted a lens and then put an SBR1C one on there, but I'd imagine that you could probably use it for that purpose as well. Thank you, Terry. That's very kind. I'm glad you find it enlightening. Um, and then as Simon was pointing out, you can use the SBR 200s in his pictures. He used them for some backlighting. So I'll show you a couple of pictures of some still life, um, dramatic still life. Way back when, it must have been about seven or eight years ago now, I did some food photography for a place around the corner from Grace. And uh, I had three SBR 200s on the table. It was a very bright and airy place, but it just had a lot of shadow on one portion of the, of the cafe. Um, and having those little speed lights just mounted on their stands off camera was very, very useful. So you can you can also, you know, play with it and find different uses for it. Let me give you some examples of some still life. These are not necessarily going to be um, the most inspiring of still lifes, but we'll see. Uh, it's not that one. Sorry. <laughs> it's a great picture of my screen. Here we go. So I did what I fancifully call... Four pairs and a jug. <laughs> so just to play with some dramatic still life and where shadows come from and to also just kind of show how light can be angled. These are underfused, these SBR 200s. So they are just kind of as they as they come with no diffusion on them whatsoever. I then added to lift the shadows a little bit and just to have an extra uh, source of light, I put the SB 600 over here. So I had the SU 800 on the camera 
then I had the SBR200 here, another one here, and then another, and then the SB600 slightly diffused over here and also slightly elevated so that it would just pick up this side of the jug. Because if you have a look back at that picture, basically you lose everything in this back portion of this of the frame whereas here okay yes I changed position but also it just illuminated that I uh, wished I had another SBR 200 I would have stuck one in the jug <laughs> and then so it had it uh, coming out of the jug I think that would have been quite cool um this is all I mean oh no sorry don't know what my mouse was doing there so this is some orchids I find orchids very difficult to take pictures of just because photographs never really do them justice and I find that white orchids on a black background this wasn't a black background, this was my kitchen window, but by using uh, a small enough aperture and also just moving the position of the, the speed light, so I ended up having an SBR 200 here and another one here uh, in relation to the, the flowers, I could get rid of all of the background. I also shot at F60. <laughs> uh, and then here is why buy strawberries unless you're gonna take pictures of them. <laughs> That's what I say. So here's a close up of a strawberry. Um, again, SBR 200s on the camera, and you can probably tell from this that I actually used the um, fluorescent gel on this one just to, to change the tones a little bit because the strawberry on its own was looking super boring. So actually just having the gels on there and then a blue gel up here. Um, and it just gives you a, a different look to your pictures. A picture, uh, I mean, I have some very nice natural light pictures of strawberries. Uh, which are great, but actually just having the gels and having the close-up flash and everything and being able to use a small aperture to get all of those little seeds in focus was uh, was what I was aiming for. So there you go. So you can be creative with these things. As I said some weeks ago now, so a long time ago, so you probably won't remember, <laughs> but um, there is a very well-known photographer who used different mirrors to position light so that when the flash hit, it would then hit a mirror and then hit the subject. Um, and it could be tiny little mirrors from, you know, Barbie doll sets, or it could be bigger mirrors, or it could be compacts, you know, like you put in your handbag. Um, and that's also another useful way to direct light. Also, reflectors. I could have used a reflector in a couple of those shots, um, and I thought about it afterwards. But if you have a reflector, do you remember the, the five-sided reflector that I showed you again a few weeks ago um, you could use that for example to lift some shadows so when you're using flash you've actually got the light bouncing from your reflector much like Simon did with the sheet of perspect and having the flash go through the back of it you could do the same with a reflector but having the light bounce off it and lift the shadows at the back so there's plenty of creativity for these still live portraits and if you're stuck indoors and you can't go out or if you can only go out as far as your garden then sometimes being able to just lift light up here there and everywhere is very very handy um yeah i struggle with orchids as well gary i am with you um that <laughs> looks quite awkward yeah so the the orchids i don't know why i just find them very difficult to photograph and do them justice i've taken lots of rubbish photos of orchids um the SBR200 has a modeling function similar to some other speed lights. It's not a very strong light. Yeah, this is another good way to do it, Simon, is to have a flash there. Um, oh, okay. So, sorry, Fatini goes commenting on from the other side. Uh, we can offer £25 off orders over 250 to our viewers. Okay, so that's a voucher code. So you should use that <laughs> if you want to order anything. I know we have a few of these SBR1C ones in second hand. Um, so if you uh, are wanting one or if you want an additional flash or something like that, use that code. That's very handy. Thank you for letting me know, Fatini. Um, so the other thing that you can do with the SU800, as I said, is fire other flashes so if you have other flashes or if you have a camera that doesn't have a built-in built-in flash like none of mine do now um, then this is a very very useful thing just to allow you to fire it there, there are alternative brands out there I've talked sometimes about um, pocket wizards couldn't remember the name of them <laughs> it's a radio trigger system it doesn't work in the same way. You have to have a unit on the bottom of your each and every flash that you want to use. You have to have a unit on the top of your camera. Um, and it's a radio triggered system rather than an infrared triggered system. Infrared is um, perhaps not as good as radio triggered because you have to have direct line of sight. For example, on the SBR200s, 
the little infrared sensor is on the bottom of the flash. I've found that even if this is not facing the SU800, it still fires, but you might struggle if you're in very bright sunlight. Bright sunlight can sometimes interrupt infrared signals. So you can see what works best for you. But if you do have flashes and you want to use the, the creative lighting system, and the creative lighting system goes right on back to the F6, um, even and, and the F5. The F5 and the F6 also work with the creative lighting system. So you can actually use the SU800 and all of these bits and pieces with even your old beloved film cameras if you've got either of those. Uh, someone said something and I missed it. Perhaps with the mug, try actual illuminating inside the mug. Yeah, I, I didn't have enough props and things and stands, otherwise I would have done that. I might rehash those pictures um, at a later stage, but I just wanted to see how it would look if I had the two SBR200s off the camera and then I had an extra speed light behind. Um, and I shot up really fast shutter speeds and really small apertures. Um, yes, thank you, Simon, reminded me. So you can use a cable to use this off camera if you um, if you needed to. So the same as if you've got a commander flash. So as I think it was David was asking me earlier, if you can use your commander flashes to fire the SBR 200s, you can alongside this. You can also use an off camera hot shoe to hot shoe cable. So it goes onto the hot shoe of your camera and it goes onto the hot shoe of the SU800 or the commander flash to then fire your remote flashes. It's a very useful thing to have. Um, the old version is called the SC17. Then it was updated to an SC28. There is not much difference except the color of the cable and perhaps some compatibility with maybe new cameras. I've never found any difference, but that's just me. And then the SC29, which has the built-in infrared assist light on the bottom, so it's a bit more expensive. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, Simon, here, here. <laughs> so if you are using it outdoor and bright light, again, I didn't have a problem with firing my flashes in very bright sunlight, but bright sunlight can interrupt infrared signals. So essentially a repeat of what Simon said and what I said before, it can cause a problem, which is why sometimes people prefer radio triggers. Also, if you're not that you necessarily would be, but if you were shooting through some a solid object like a wall or something like that, then infrared signals don't pass through walls. They it just doesn't work. <laughs> so um, so radio triggers can be very useful for that. Let me just um, I don't have it on my desk because it's in my camera bag. Of course it is. Oh, unless it's here. No, it's not. My WR10, which I've talked about a couple of times. The WR10, um, my lights just died, so hopefully I'm not in complete darkness or in half darkness. Um, the WR10 is the radio trigger system that I have talked about multiple times. It works with all Nikon cameras. It consists of three parts, an adapter if you need it for the 10-pin socket, and then you've got the uh, transceiver, as they call, which goes into the camera, and then you've got the transmitter, which is the little push button that fires things. So you can use that as a remote, but you can also use it to fire the SB5000. I'm afraid to say that Nikon are still out of stock of the transceiver bit. That is the bit that they seem to be struggling to get hold of. It's been nearly a year and we haven't had them. Um, but radio triggers can be very handy, particularly if you need to be behind a wall or behind a solid object. I have had um, photographers go into wedding venues and they stick a flash behind a sofa and then they wonder why it doesn't fire. <laughs> it doesn't fire because the infrared signal can't reach through the sofa. That's all there is to it. But if you have your flashes within direct line of sight, um, it will work. Another thing, if you've got an assistant and they put their finger over the infrared transmitter, sorry, receiver. So if you've got someone holding a flash and you put your finger over this bit, then don't expect the infrared signal to travel through your fingers. It doesn't work. So you just have to be aware of that little um, that little part there. It has a kind of arrow with a circle in it. That's the creative lighting system symbol, meaning that that's where it receives its signal from. So there's a few things to bear in mind. Um, Terry has the SC17, SB28 and SB600. Yeah, SC17 works with all of those. I only ever found, this is my experience and, and um, I'm sure that other people will probably find the same. I only found one camera that didn't work with the SC17. It was a D750 and it was with an SB600. It was bizarre. I, it worked with other SC17. So the actual SC17 itself, as far as I know, as far as I know, don't quote me on this, um, is essentially the same as the SC28. It's a different color cable. 
the 17 is grey, the ST28 is black. Maybe there's a slight length difference, maybe there's some different wiring in it or something like that. But if you've got an old SC17 kicking around, the hot shoe fitting is the same. So, you know, if you if you do already have one, then try that before you buy a new flash uh, cable. Right, I think, I think I've covered all my notes on the SBR1C1 and I managed to do it in under an hour. <laughs> That's amazing. So if you have any questions, let me know. Simon is on the chat, so he can also answer away. Um, and other than that, as Fatini mentioned, if you want to use the code, you can go ahead and use the code. I think that's fantastic. Um, hmm. SB600 is CLS compatible, but lacks the commander mode. That is right. Infrared is still light, so it can be blocked by objects. Exactly. Everyone's just going, yes, exactly what she said. <laughs> Um, which is very, very true. So infrared's great unless you're not in direct line of sight or unless you've got very, very bright sunlight. Um, the SB600 is a slave flash. It doesn't have command mode in it, but the SC17 will fire it off camera. There we go. I think everyone's got the answer to their questions. All right, so um, I, didn't th I don't think I missed anything of what was in the box or anything like that. So if you have any questions on the SBR1C1, let me know. Um, if you have any questions about any of the flash, uh, let Simon know. <laughs> no, you can let me know too. It's fine. Um, yes, this is very. This is a very good point, Simon. So if you've you can ba yeah, because the infrared signal can bounce off other solid objects. It is fantastic if you're in a, a room which is all kind of hard shiny walls, the infrared signal can bounce everywhere. The Nikon School Building, if you've ever been there, downstairs um, is great. It will fire the signals around. It's a very kind of echoey room. Um, whereas in a place where there's very plush furnishings, furnishings and it's very kind of dark and muted, you might um, struggle a little bit. Can you use a PC cable to fire the SU-800? Okay, so the SU-800 has uh, a, a it has a cable socket, but it's not for a PC sync cable socket. It's a different one. Simon can remind me which one that is. It's a socket that you use for studio flashes, but I can't remember which one. Um, but no, you can't use a PC sync socket. I mean, this is a commander, so you wouldn't necessarily need this. You just, if you need a PC sync socket, you got one on the front of your camera right there. Or if you've got a camera that doesn't have a PC sync socket, like a D750 or a D600, then you get the little adapter that sits on your hot shoe. I think it's called an AS21 off the top of my head. And that has a sync socket on it. Um, there we go. That, I think that answered your question. Whoever it was. Andy. <laughs> there we go. Um, John is going to stick with bronze color. color. Fine. No problem. Uh, Steve says gets better results with available light. I got loads of rubber shots of orchids with available light. I, I like the dramatic black backgrounds. That's just me. Um, but yes, I can I can see why that would be. I'd like also like to have very very uh, wide depth of field because if you've got a very shallow depth of field, then you just don't get all that rich detail in orchids. And I have probably about seven or eight orchids of different colours and varieties, and I like to get all of that detail. That is it from me. <laughs> I'm, I am done. If you have any other questions, I will try and answer them. But otherwise, I will see you next Tuesday. It's Thursday, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So I will see you next Tuesday for another hopefully riveting installment of uh, the Grey's Westminster live stream. And um, feel free to keep sending me your pictures by email, uploading them to the drive folder, asking me questions. I do try and answer them as quickly as I can for everyone. If you've got any topics you want me to cover, this was a request from someone, the SBR1C1, and I had loads of fun doing it. So thank you to whoever it was that requested that I do the SBR1C1. Um, and I will see you next week. So um, have a great long weekend. It's a bank holiday. Have a fantastic weekend and I'll see you then. Everybody take care and stay safe.